good morning everyone and this is <clears throat> the continuation of the previous lecture we are doing neurological examination and uh, actually neurological neurological examination is quite a long one so maybe this lecture will take one or two more lectures so <clears throat> in the previous lecture we talk about a little about history then we talk about how to start any examination we talk about uh, the general physical examination we talk about what is general appearance then we have to take the vitals and then we talk about like <clears throat> what to do once uh, you have started the examination msc or mmse <clears throat> after that i told you different parts of neurological examination and this one is about as you can see cranial nerve examination the good thing i always ask the medical students to follow <clears throat> there are some good channels on the youtube for example one is called as geeky geeky medics they have a app also so geeky medics is also uh, is a very good one uh, why i'm saying okay there are videos for physical examination for on uh, oxford and there are different websites you know and different youtube channels which which give the videos for physical examination but geeky medics you know they make it very simple for medical students and once like you will maybe you won't understand them at this stage because you haven't started um your clinical subjects completely so maybe you will not understand them right now but that's a very good channel and they have examination video of almost everything uh, even like uh, some of the examinations which don't you don't need uh, they have like quite extensive because they had made that, that channel to help the people who are preparing for different exams as well like uh, plab or usmle and exams like this so anyhow let's start and uh, i have a concept of bare minimum for the medical students like uh, the things which every medical student should know to be called or to be uh, cons considered that as a medical student <clears throat> for example i always in the physical classes i always ask like the students do they know the name of the cranial nerves and it's not important that you know the names of the cranial nerves but what is important you must know the names of the cranial nerves in sequence why because when we do the physical examination we go in the same sequence okay like and i don't know why people forget them because you know i remember them from the first year of my medical school and i still remember them in the same way same same thing there is no difference at all so the bare minimum for when we examine the cranial nerves is like we must check the fundi we must check the visual fields we must check the pupil size and their reactivity and must we must check extra ocular movements as well as facial movements why because we are doing neurological examination and in neurology a very important thing is stroke and not just stroke like facial nerve palsy is one of them optic problems are also there optic nerve problems as well as many things or intracranial things pressure on the third nerve or things like this the patients they present with change in the pupil size as well as like the visual visual fields or the reactivity one thing which i would suggest to you guys is to take it as a homework and believe me it will help you read all the cranial nerves neuroanatomy very 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 important rather read the clinical neuroanatomy as well because if you don't know from where the cranial nerves they originate if you don't know what are the tracts what are the things what are the functions which are mixed which are sensory which are motor 
which carries autonomic fibers, you will not get a lot of concepts. Okay, so like take it as a homework, write time, you have a lot of time, you can go through that then and you can make better concepts. Okay, see, here there are mnemonics are written, okay, and old Olympus tiny tops of Finn and German viewed some hops on occasion of tea parties, the attractive faces are girls, visitors say hi, some say merry money, but my brother says big businesses make money, okay. And there are some bad ones as well. Of course, I cannot say it, say them here. You can Google it, you can find. But I don't remember the names of Cranial Loves by any mnemonic. It's on my fingertips. And once you will start practicing, you will understand. You will remember the names. From where they originate, you know, like, Actually, the first two nerves, you know, olfactory and optic, they are not true cranial nerves. Rather, they can, you can say they are they are the old growth of the <clears throat> brain. And the next two cranial nerves, like the third and fourth, they originate from the midbrain. Then the next four cranial nerves, from hair to hair, they originate from the pons. And the last four originate from the medulla. Easy to, way to remember. So, olfactory... Optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, auditory, glossopharyngeal, vagus. The spelling is not correct, so I must correct them. <coughs> Spinal and hypoglossal, these are the nerves. What is the function of olfactory nerve? So, the smell. Usually this nerve is not tested clinically, but by the way, we can simply ask the patient, like, do they have any um, change in the sense of smell? So, like, there can be anosmia or parosmia, like anosmia, like absence of smell, sensation, and parosmia. So, olfactory, then we check Optic. Optic nerves have a very interesting type of tract. This is the nerve of the vision you can set say. So to test this we check the visual equity, we check the visual fields, I will show you how. We check the fundus, okay. If you know this is Snell's chart to check your visual equity, this is the visual fields, you know. Of course, like if I will start giving lecture on this one, we cannot finish, like maybe two hours is needed just to teach you this thing. Okay, and then we, we check the fundus, we do a fundoscopy. I'll show, I'll show you what is fundoscopy, right? This is fundoscope. So. <clears throat> By using this, we can see the back of the eye or the retina, and we can check the optic disc, and we we can check all the four quadrants of the optic disc because many conditions have this thing. So then we go for oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens. Like abducens is basically six nerve, but we simply because all of these controls the eye movement, so we just check them all together. Very easy to remember the functions of these nerves. You just have to remember one formula that is called as LR6SO4. Okay, so what is the formula? It is LR6SO4. So basically, LR is lateral rectus, which is controlled by the sixth cranial nerve. SO is superior oblique, which is controlled by the fourth cranial nerve. So leave these two muscles, all the other extraocular muscles are innervated by the third cranial nerve. So LR6 SO4, lateral rectus is controlled by the sixth cranial nerve, which is abducens and SO4, superior oblique is controlled by fourth cranial nerve, which is trochlear. Rest, leave these two muscles, rest, all the muscles are controlled by oculomotor nerve. So we examine the oculo like the movements of the eye 
ask the patient to follow a finger with their eyes and check gaze. Okay, by the way, I'm not going to, uh, like, what is the thing, you know? We examine the pupils as well, what is the size, and then we check it, the pupil's reaction to the light. We shine the light in one eye and see if the pupil is constricting or not. That is called as the direct light reflex, and then we shine the light in the same eye and see the pupil re reaction in the other eye. This is called as consensual light reflex. Okay. And then we check for the accommodation reflex. We ask the patient to look straight at some distance and then bring something close to his eyes and ask them to focus on that one. This is called as the accommodation reflex. What happens like the pupil constrict and the eyes, they merge towards that object. Okay. Before going on to like the next video, like the next one. This video introduces general observations of neurologic status and then focuses on examination of the cranial nerves, including assessment of the motor and sensory portions of cranial nerves 1 through 12, and examination of the sensory system, including assessment of pain, temperature, light touch, and vibratory sensations, as well as position sense and discriminative sensations. In this video, the examiner will assess a healthy patient. Your patients may have the same normal findings or may exhibit normal variations or abnormal findings. Okay. See this one? To perform the neurologic exam, to perform the... Of course, I'm not a professional editor and I don't use any editing software, so rather I just go simple neurologic examination efficiently, combine portions of it with other parts of the assessment, such as the interview. When talking with the patient, observe the patient's mental status, speech, mood, memory, and orientation. So see, what I was talking about, that whenever we examine anyone, you know, first thing we do is the general appearance, and that's what he's saying, and see, he said, like, talk to the patient because right now he's just focusing on um, looking at, like, examining the cranial nerve. So he said, like, talk to the patient and observe his memory and speech and everything because, you know, neurological problems, they cause problem with the language, with the speech and all these things. So that's what they are saying. And then we are going oh, to talk, it. like, uh, see the third video in which, like, he's going to start with the cranial nerve examination. Uh, okay, to see, to start with this one, you can see. Uh, a lot of function. First, be sure both nasal passages are patent. Any problems? No. Then, with one of the patient's no. nostrils occluded no. and his eyes closed, no. pass a mildly aromatic and familiar no. substance, no. such as vanilla, cloves, and soap, and or coffee, under the open nostril. If the patient detects the smell, the ask him to identify it. Breathe Repeat this test on the other side. See this one, uh, I told you like usually we don't follow, the, uh, we don't examine uh, the first cranial nerve in real clinical scenario because you know, uh, we can just simply ask the patient like if they have any change in sense of smell recently, right? But <coughs> there is a way to check like what he's telling, obstruct as one of the nostrils, ask him to close his eyes and then bring something, whatever you have like coffee beans uh, is a very good thing. Avoid bringing something which is which really smells bad because you know that is going to offend the patient. Cranial nerve two, the optic nerve, mediates vision. I'd like to test your vision now. If you could hold to assess its function, check the patient's visual acuity and visual fields, and inspect the optic fundi. Can you read the numbers on that? If a Snellen chart is not available, Nine, test visual acuity three, by using a special handheld eye card. To do this, ask the patient to cover one eye, hold the card about 14 inches away from his eyes, and read aloud the smallest print possible. Four. If the patient requires reading or general purpose glasses or contact lenses, he should wear them. Can you cover up the other eye? Then test the other eye. For screening purposes, visual fields are tested by confrontation. 
Face the patient directly and imagine a glass bowl encircling the head. Ask the patient to look with both eyes into your eyes. Then place your hands about two feet apart, lateral to the patient's ears. Then slowly move the wiggling fingers of both hands along the imaginary bowl until the patient identifies them. Repeat this action in the upper and lower temporal quadrants. Normally, a person sees both sets of fingers at the same time. I'd like you to cover up your left eye. If you think you've found a visual field I'd defect, like such as loss of vision in the right temporal field, slowly move your wiggling fingers from the defective area of the field toward the better vision. Repeat this at several levels until you can define the border of the defect. These responses suggest a defect throughout the temporal half of the field. Test the other eye for an accompanying defect. Next, inspect each ocular fundus by using an ophthalmoscope. Assess the optic nerve by inspecting the optic disc. Note its color, the sharpness of the margins, and the width of the physiologic cup. So, you can see in this one what they had done is, uh, he's talking about the Snell's chart, like usually we had the big one, but like in, in office, like the clinics, GP clinic, uh, there's a small handheld cell chart as well, which he was using. And then if you can see, what he checked is the visual fields, and then he checked did the ophthalmoscopy. Cranial nerves 3, 4, and... So here, like cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, which I was talking about is like the third cranial nerve, fourth and sixth, and I told you LR6 as a four. You know, they are the one which you can check together, and they are the one which deals with the oculo motor, like all the extraocular movements. Six, the oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens nerves control eye movements. Because these nerves work together so closely, they're examined as a group. The oculomotor nerve is also responsible for pupillary constriction and raising the upper eyelid. Check the position of the upper eyelids while the patient looks directly at you. The eyelids should be symmetrical and should not obscure the pupils. Next, inspect the pupils. They should be round and approximately equal in size. Size should be appropriate to room light. Test the pupillary reaction to light by shining a light on each pupil in turn. Observe for the direct reaction and the consensual reaction. If the light reaction is abnormal or ambiguous, test the patient's near reaction. Hold your finger or a pencil about 10 centimeters from the patient's eyes and tell him what to do. Look at my finger. Look off into the distance. Watch for pupillary dilation with distant gaze and pupillary constriction with near effort. Look at my finger. Look off to the distance. Repeat this test if necessary. Look off to the distance. Now check the extraocular movements in the six cardinal directions of gaze. From two to three feet in front of the patient, ask him to look at your finger as it moves to the patient's far right, to the right and up, to the right and down. Now move your finger to the far left, to the left and up, and to the left and down. These movements should be symmetrical and conjugate. Look for the jerky movements of nystagmus in lateral gaze and in upward gaze. Test for convergence of the eyes by asking the patient to look at your finger as you move it toward the bridge of his nose. Eyes can usually follow your finger to within 5 to 8 centimeters. So if you can see in this one, what I was talking about, the uh, accommodation reflex, and in this one they are checking about, telling you about how to check the extraocular movements, okay? And then... The sensory portion of cranial nerve, nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve... Okay. So... You can see this one, they, they teach you, they tell you how to uh, 
check the pupillary reflex, how to check the eye movements and all those things. What I would suggest to you is to go right click cranial nerve examination or you can see also write cranial nerve examination for medical students and then you will see the videos which, which like which explain all these things right anyhow then we go for trigeminal nerve Trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve. It has a sensory and motor fibers. So the sensory fibers, basically trigeminal nerve, it divides into three branches. One is ophthalmic, one is maxillary, and one is mandibular, V1, V2, and V3. So it carries the sensation from all over the face, as well as it carries special taste sensations, okay, from, from the tongue. So, sorry, it, it, it carries sensation, not taste sensation, only sensations from the tongue. Not taste sensations, that is carried by other nerve, okay. The motor part is, it supplies to the muscles of mastication. The muscles which you use for mastication. So, this is the function of the trigeminal nerve. I will show you how to check them. Trigeminal nerve also is involved in two reflexes one is corneal reflex which again we don't do usually in clinics because what is this if something will touch to your cornea basically your eye blinks so the afferent fibers are taken from by the fifth nerve which is trigeminal and when the eye blinks which means efferent fibers come from the cranial nerve 7 so what we do we ask the patient to look up and we tell them that we are going to touch them with a cotton wool basically to the cornea and once you touch you know like normally we blink and the other reflex which trigeminal nerve in which trigeminal nerve is involved it's, it's called as the jaw reflex again like usually not done so this is like see when you when you touch the cornea by a cotton wool the patients they blink and this is how we do a jaw reflex Put a finger under the lower lip and hit your finger by the hammer. And there is like a jerk you will feel, right? So that is trigeminal. Now the facial nerve, it is the nerve <coughs> which is also called as the nerve of facial expression. Because all the motor fibers or the motor, motor supply is done by the facial nerve like like how you make uh, faces, you know, how you make, give expressions by the face, how you close the eyes and close your mouth and all these things, you know, all the, all the facial muscles are supplied by the seventh cranial nerve. So, of course, first of all, we inspect, we check the forehead, creases are equal. Then we ask the patient to raise the eyebrows, close the eyes, don't let us open, close the mouth, don't let us open. Sometimes we ask them to blow, show, show your teeth, smile and things like this. And it also carries the taste sensation from the anterior two-third of, two of the tongue. See this one is like the facial nerve. By the way, in ENT you are going to read about facial nerve completely. Because uh, there is a very important thing called as Bell's palsy, and facial nerve have a very interesting type of innervation. If if you will take the homework in seriously, you you will read about the upper motor neuron type of lesion and lower motor neuron type of lesion. You can see the facial nerve is the nerve which uh, which is supplying the facial muscles as well as one muscle in the ear, the stapedius. It is carrying the taste sensations from the anterior two-third of the tongue. So red one is motor fibers, blue one is special sensations. Then it also supplies the lacrimal glands, the sublingual glands, as well as the submandibular glands. Okay. So this is the autonomic function of the facial nerve. So see, a lot of function, functions of the facial nerve is there. So... 
this is what I'm I'm talking about the facial nerve. Uh, basically, the upper part, the the nerve which is supplying the upper part of the face, or you can say the forehead, receive the fibers from both sides of the brain, whereas the lower part only receives the information from one side of the brain. So that's why, whenever there is stroke in any patient, the patient forehead is spared. But whenever the lesion is lower motor neuron type of lesion, then all the half of the face is affected. After facial, fifth, uh, seventh, there is eighth cranial nerve, which is vestibulocochlear nerve, which is a hearing nerve, and that is the one by which we hear the things as well as we maintain the balance. And to test that, what we do, we do tests called as Weber's and Rennie's test. Okay. And uh, what is Weber's test? We strike the tuning fork, we put it in the middle of the forehead. And we ask like if the patient can hear in both of the ears equally or the sound is literalized in one ear. So what happens in the normal persons, like the, the vibration can be heard in both of the ears equally. But if anyone have bone, uh, there is two types of, you can say, deafness. One is called as sensory neural deafness, like uh, hearing loss when the nerve have some problem and the other thing is like uh, conduction deafness or you can say like there is some problem in the conduction pathway like all the you know the, the ear have small bones called as incus malleus and stapes so sometimes they have like some pathologies so in the case of uh, conductive deafness or conductive hearing loss the sound is literalized to the affected ear, ear. And this thing you can check if you will put like block your one ear and you will say something you will hear the your voice louder in that ear which is blocked so this is a very easy way to remember like the con in conductive hearing loss weber test is literalized to the bad ear whereas in sensory neural deafness weber test is literalized to the good ear then we go for Rennie's test after that <clears throat> so this is the eighth cranial nerve then the ninth cranial nerve and tenth cranial nerve they are tested together ninth is glossopharyngeal and tenth is vagus why are they tested together because both of them they supply the pharyngeal muscles by which you speak you swallow so to test them you know what we ask the patient to open the mouth we check the uvula if it's in the middle or not and then we ask the patient to say to make some sound like ah uh, like this right and we see like if there is if both of them they are they are equal bilaterally equal or not there is gag reflex if you know what is gag reflex you know when we put something in the mouth for example if you are going to put your finger inside your mouth and touch the back of your mouth or you can say oral cavity you have you know that thing like this so that is basically gag so gag reflex is done by these nerves so whenever these nerves are damaged you know the gag reflex is absent so this is like the ninth and tenth cranial nerve and then there is accessory cranial nerve which is the eleventh cranial nerve so this is the nerve which supplies your trapezius muscles as well as sternocleidomastoid so what we ask the patient to shrug the shoulders and we, we try to push the shoulders down as well as we see the power in their sternocleidomastoid muscles. And the last one is hypoglossal, which is the nerve. So see, when the patients shrug their shoulders, they ask, they, they try to push it down. And this one is like here, they are checking the sternocleidomastoid. Of course, when I will show you the video, the thing will be clear. And the last nerve is hypoglossal nerve, which is basically the 12th cranial nerve sorry here there is a mistake because this one is cranial nerve 12 so it should be this thing so this one is the one which is innervating the tongue or the intrinsic muscles of the tongue so we can ask the patient to protrude the tongue out and then we ask the patient we have to check the power of the tongue so what we do we, we can press the tongue against the cheeks 
okay so this is how we examine the cranial nerves anyhow I will show you some of the video and then you would know what I'm talking about so these are the cranial nerves with the examinations and what abnormalities can be there the sensor okay Let's see this one portion of cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, mediates facial sensation and the sensory part of the corneal reflex. The motor portion of the nerve innervates all the muscles of mastication. I'm going to test, to test the nerve's motor function, ask the patient to clench and then relax his jaw while you palpate the temporal muscles and then the masseter muscles. Note the strength of muscle contraction. Relax. So see, the sensory portion of the trigeminal. He is checking the motor part of the trigeminal. So, when you clench your teeth, you will feel the muscles tightening over here as well as here. So these are all the muscles which are supplied by the trigeminal. And now he is going to check, check the sensory part. So this area is supplied by V1 or ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal. This area is supplied by V2 or maxillary branch of the trigeminal. And this area is supplied by V3 or the mandibular branch of the uh, trigeminal. The nerve has three divisions, the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular divisions. All three areas should be tested symmetrically by assessing the patient's sensation of pain, light touch, and perhaps temperature. I want you to close your Explain eyes. Explain and show the patient how you will assess for pain. Then, with the patient's eyes closed, sharp. test for pain sensation using the sharp end of a previously unused safety pin or sharp. other suitable sharp object. Occasionally, no. substitute the dull end for the sharp one as you test sharp. scattered areas. Sharp. Sharp. Now I'm going to compare side to side. Keep your eyes closed. Is this the same as this? Then compare yes. symmetrical areas on this. both sides of the face. The same as this. Yes. If you suspect an abnormality, Hot. confirm it by testing temperature sensitivity. Cold. Again, explain the test first Cold. to the patient. Then, with the patient's eyes Hot. closed, test scattered areas. If indicated, compare sides. Cold. I'm going to test the sensation of your face. So see, he is checking all the sensations. Sharp sensations, fine touch, Root touch, temperature, pain. Based by lightly touching the cotton against your skin. When you feel the cotton touch, I want you to say now. Now if you close your eyes. Next, test for light touch using a wisp of cotton. After explaining now. the procedure, test in scattered areas. Now, now. keep your eyes closed. Again, compare sides. Is this the same as this? Yes. To test the corneal reflex, ask the patient to look up and away from you. Now approach the patient from the side, out of his line of vision, and lightly touch the cornea with a fine wisp of cotton. Normally, the patient's eyes blink and tear, but a contact lens wearer may have diminished or absent corneal reflexes. Normally this is not done. Cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, innervates all the muscles of facial movement and expression. It also mediates taste sensation in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. To assess this nerve, inspect the patient's face at rest and during conversation. Note any asymmetry and look for tics or other involuntary movements. Next, ask the patient to raise his eyebrows, frown, Close his eyes so tightly you can't open them. Show his teeth. Smile. And puff out your cheeks. And puff out his cheeks. Normally, the patient can do these maneuvers easily and symmetrically. And last one. Cranial nerve. To finish the cranial nerve examination. So he have done facial as well. Eight, which
which is the acoustic nerve, mediates hearing and vestibular function. Because vestibular function is not routinely tested, our exam will focus on hearing. I'm going to, to assess hearing, vestibular. occlude one of the patient's ears with your finger, stand one to two feet away from the patient, and cover your mouth to prevent lip reading. Two, now four. test the open ear by softly whispering numbers or words. Gradually increase your voice volume until the patient can identify the spoken numbers or words. If hearing is diminished, test for lateralization by performing the Weber test. To do this, place the base of a vibrating tuning fork firmly on top of the patient's head. Then ask if he hears the sound on one or both sides. Normally, the sound is heard midline or equally on both sides. Next, compare air and bone conduction by performing the RINA test. Place a lightly vibrating tuning fork on the mastoid bone behind the ear. When the patient indicates that the sound is no longer heard, quickly place the vibrating fork near the ear canal. Normally, the patient can hear the sound longer through air than through bone. Be sure to test the opposite ear. So... <clears throat> These are some of the videos which I show you and for the other training learners, as I told you, you can watch videos, they are available, okay, a lot of them they are available on YouTube, you can watch, just write examination of the training learners and you will find, from, find out. Okay, so in neurology, uh, like once you have done training love examination, uh, then we have to like, uh, do other examination like uh, motor examination so in motor examination again the bare minimum is like look for the muscle atrophy and check extremity tone assess upper extremity strength by checking for pronator different strength of the wrist or fingers extensor tap the biceps patellar and Achilles reflexes test for lower extremity strength by having the patient walk normally and on heels and toes okay uh, basically guys like I will tell you first of all like uh, the basics how the motor system works in the brain there is a precortex region which basically comes which basically is also called as the motor region and this is the area where all them uh, Areas are there, like areas which control our upper limb, areas which control our lower limbs, areas which control our face, our, like, whatever, like, you're moving, you know, the areas are there. There is area for the face, upper limb, lower limb. <laughs> the fibers from there, they come down and they enter the midbrain and then they descend down in the form of the bundle so you can see over here this is the midbrain and then this is the pons and this is the medulla and then they cross over on the other side so remember the right side of the body is controlled by the left side of the brain and the same thing the left side of the brain controls the uh, sorry the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body Now, what will happen if someone has a stroke on the left side of the brain? Of course, the right side of the body gets paralyzed. Depending on which area is uh, infected, for example, if the upper limb area is infected, the patient will be having weakness in the upper limb. For example, if the lower limb area is infected, the patient will be having weakness in the lower limb and same for the head or the trunk. You know, this is, this tracks, these tracks are also called as a descending track, or you can say corticospinal track because this one are arising from the cortex and going all the way through the spinal cord. So that's why it is also called as corticospinal tracks, or it is also called as the pyramidal system because they make pyramids when they pass, pass through the medulla. So simply, the thing is, <clears throat> these these are these all neuro you know what is neurons neurons are basically the 
the, the things, you know, the fibers or the things which carries the sensations or which carries the impulses and the neurons are interconnected with each other. So the neurons which are present in the C and S, like in the brain, as well as in the spinal cord, are called as the upper motor neurons. Okay? They are the called as the upper motor neuron. Then there, there is like the, uh, a collection of cell body over here. And then the fibers, they leave from the spinal cord in the form of a peripheral nerve. First anterior and posterior roots and then like they make a spinal nerve. The nerve is the part of the peripheral nervous system, whereas all these things is a part of central nervous system. So whenever there is any pathology in this area of CNS, we call it as upper motor neuron lesion. And whenever there is any pathology in the peripheral periphery or other than the CNS, we call that thing as lower motor neuron lesion. Why this thing is important? Because clinically, our diagnosis is based on either the patient is showing upper motor neuron type of features or lower motor neuron type of features. Okay. I'll give you a better mnemonic than this. So, this one, very easy to remember. Whenever... The patient, you're examining a patient and, okay, before going on this, by the way, I must tell you the mnemonic so that you have, see, for example, we are examining, examination of lower limb, for example, okay, I'm just giving you an example. So I will remember this mnemonic, I, T, P, R, C, S. So what is I? I is for inspection. What is T? T is for tone. What is P? P is for power. We check the power of the muscles. What is R? R is for reflexes. What is C? C is for coordination. And what is S? S is for sensation. So first of all, I will look at the limb, lower limb. I will look for any wasting, any deformity, any swelling, any fasciculations, okay, all these things. Then I will try to, I will not try, I will, I will move all the joints, I will, I will see like either the patient like normally, you know, in normal people, if you will see, like our body is maintaining some tone, the muscles is maintaining some tone. So when we move, if the tone looks like normal, so that's fine. But if it's difficult to move the joints for, that is called as hypertonia. And if the, the limb is floppy, it means hypotonia. Then I will check the power of the muscles. I will ask the patient to flex the limb or flex the knee or flex the ankle and try to resist that to check the power. And I will keep on comparing between the two limbs. Then I will check the reflexes. If you know, like they take a neurological hammer and they put, they, they strike your knee and they see the knee jerk, right? That like the leg is moving or not. So that is reflexes. And then I will check the coordination I will tell you or how to do the coordination, brother. I will tomorrow. I'm going to show you in the next lecture one video that will make your concept better. And then I will check the sensations. Again, the same thing. I will check the vibration. I will check the proprioception. I will check the temperature. I will check the pain sensations. Now, see in this one. Whenever anyone have upper motor neuron type of lesion, the problem is in the CNS. There is muscle weakness. But you will see over here, lower motor neuron lesion also gives muscle weakness. So see, same thing is present. Now, how to differentiate that this muscle weakness is due to some problem in the CNS or in the PNS, like peripheral nervous system. When we check the reflexes and the problem is 
upper motor neuron region type like stroke their reflexes are increased exaggerated hyper reflexia whereas lower motor neuron type of region give decreased tendon reflexes hypo reflexia or maybe the reflexes are absent okay I'll leave this one because this one is not a part of lower lower motor neuron type of lesion shows fasciculation okay and wasting the muscles will look like wasted and you will found fasciculations and when you will check the tone there is hypotonia or flaccidity but, but wherever in upper motor neuron type of lesion there is spasticity okay and one of the thing which is called as Babinski sign what we do we basically stroke the but I, I want to show you yeah we, we stroke the sole of the feet in this direction like this and we see how the how the toes are moving normally the toe big toe goes into flexion okay but if the toe is like you can say plantar flexion if the toe is going into extension okay or up going up going means what like towards the head face this is called as Babinski sign positive this is a feature of upper motor neuron type of region so guys of course like there will be a second part of this motor system just remember four things number one flaccidity in lower spasticity in upper decrease or absent reflexes in lower hyper reflex or increased reflexes in upper third thing fasciculations in lower okay fasciculations in lower now one thing Babinski sign positive in upper whereas Babinski sign negative or absent in lower if you can remember this thing this is the basics of neurological diagnosis so see the stroke patients they show these features anyone who have stroke they show these features anyone who have diabetes and he have peripheral neuropathy they will show these features for example someone who whose nerve get damaged they will show these features someone who has stroke who has spinal cord problem who have tumor in the brain or anything like this they will show these features okay so this is like the concept of upper motor neuron lesion features and lower motor neuron features and that this is the you can say the uh, most important thing which we check which we do when we go or when we examine anyone neurologically so anyhow uh, I will tell you something neurology like I started teaching in neurology and uh, what I have seen like many of the students you know their basics in neurology is not developed at all like what they do with us when we were medical students like they they, they teach us neuroanatomy in the, in the second year and they like we, we had a four or five months of continuous teaching of brain tracks and all this stuff and they take a lot of exams for this thing so guys like you know very important thing like if you don't know the basics of course the things will become hard and you will you won't understand neurology ne neurology you know and neurological examination so well, like uh, you can take it as a homework that at least try to read about the 12 cranial nerves okay uh, see what is their function how they function and what are the tracks they have okay and how they control different a uh, different things right and if you have time read about the descending tracks read about how uh, the tracks they cross over how they innervate what is upper motor neuron neurons and what are lower motor neurons like of course these things are very important and 
these things are those like who's who were were very important for you to uh, develop good concepts okay so tomorrow i will include like the video for motor examination as well as sensory examination uh, and then like i will discuss more about this one thank you so much for listening